Amen. Good morning. To see, good to see all of you. I don't need a hand clap. That's all right. <laughs> hey, this is good to see all of you here. Are you glad to be in church? I, I hope that you've come this morning expecting and uh, for something good to happen. So um, we have missionaries that are here with us this weekend. Samantha and Brandon Lighty are our missionaries to Turkey. They are fantastic, incredible missionaries who are serving in that part of the world. They happen to have a Sunday open, so they are here this morning. They're sharing in uh, Sunday school hour right now in the Yulstead Chapel, and they will be in the Yulstead Chapel for the 11 o'clock Sunday school time. So I'd encourage you, if you don't have a class or you want to go check out what's going on there, uh, they are sharing in that class uh, at 11 o'clock, and they will be doing a, a window uh, sharing in the service tonight. So if you miss them during the Sunday school time, I encourage you to come back tonight for worship. Tonight we continue in a series to this morning as well on worship. Pastor Austin uh, shared a message last week, a phenomenal message. If you missed that, I encourage you to get back online and watch that message. And in the evenings for the next few weeks, we're going to be following the various Greek or Hebrew words for praise. When you read a word like give thanks or praise in the Old Testament, there's a, a, a Hebrew word, one of probably seven Hebrew words that are translated praise. Just like the word love in Greek is three different words for love. There are a lot of varieties. It has to do with postures in worship and how we can praise God. There's not just one prescribed way to do it. And I encourage uh, you to come back tonight. Pastor Brian's going to be sharing. He will do a phenomenal job delivering that word. I encourage you to get your missions banquet tickets. And uh, that is coming up sooner than you think. It's Friday, April 1st. If you would lo- like to host a missionary that week, we have missionaries on the first Sunday, which is March 27. And we'll have missionaries through the week until that following Sunday, April 3rd. Uh, If you would like to host a missionary in your home, a meal with a missionary, stop at the table where they're selling tickets and let Mary know that you would be willing to open your home, invite some friends. So this is a time where you're not going to get a message uh, from a missionary, but you actually get to sit down, have them in your home, and and share a meal together. And those are phenomenal times. And so I encourage you, if you would like to be involved that way, stop at the table and let them let them know. I want to say hi to our online uh, family. Would you just give a, a hand for people who are joining us online this morning? We love you. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. So we're continuing in this series on worship. And the title of, in your bulletin today just says part three. I have given it a title, and that is the power of worship. Pastor Austin made this mention last week that we could probably spend six months of sermons morning and night talking about worship, and we're just doing this for a couple of weeks before we get into a series working up to Easter. Uh, but this, this message this morning, the power of worship, and I will get into this in a minute if you'll turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm 40. We're going to be camping out on one verse today, Psalm 40, verse 3. Psalm 40, verse 3 says that, you know what? I got to be in the right book. Job. (laughs) Job 40 doesn't cut it, guys. Turn back a book. How many knew that Job was right before Psalms? All right, that's a very different verse. This is what it says. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Before we moved to Urbandale, almost 25 years ago, it would be 25 years this fall, we lived and pastored in Livingston, Montana. Livingston, Montana, many of you, if you've gone to Yellowstone National Park, you most likely have driven through through Livingston. It's right on I-90. And uh, straight north of the north entrance of Yellowstone Park, just 50 miles north of Yellowstone. 
So we live 50 miles from Yellowstone. It was phenomenal to have that in our backyard, which means that we could drive to Yellowstone and visit Yellowstone National Park anytime we wanted to. Jeannie and I would do, often in the fall, we would uh, take a couple hours in the afternoon, t pack a lunch, drive down to Mammoth Hot Springs right inside the park, and the elk would be uh, in rut, and so the big bulls were bugling, and they'd have their harem of cows all herded up, and we would just sit and eat our lunch, listen to the elk bugle. It was phenomenal. You, you just can't get that anywhere uh, in the world, and so we, we, I can't tell you how many times I've been to Yellowstone National Park, but I wonder how many of you have visited Yellowstone sometime in your life. Raise your hand and hold it up. Uh, this is crazy, because it was the majority of people in the early service uh, had been there, and it, I, I'd say it's one of the most amazing places on the face of earth. There is, there is some amazing features there. Yellowstone um, is, uh, actually, they, somebody just told me this morning, and I think I've heard this before, that it's the largest volcano in the world that sits underneath Yellowstone. There's a lot of seismic activity, and they say that Yellowstone is just a ticking time bomb, that if, if the earth, earthquakes or the volcano takes off, I mean, th that part of the world is just gonna be decimated. Um, but I lived right, right next to it, right over the top of that, and uh, I'd have to say just the opportunity to go there and visit, to see all the geysers, the hot pots, the mud pots, the fumaroles, that's, it's some pretty amazing features. And there's a, definitely a distinct smell of sulfur in, in Yellowstone that stays with you for a long time. But some of the most gorgeous scenery that you've ever seen and features that you've ever, ever been uh, able to, uh, to be part of. So, like I said, I've got countless pictures, and except through my lifetime visiting there with my children, we have gone through a lot of different uh, generations of cameras video cameras. I have videotapes of like three different varieties, um, VHS, compact VHS, Super 8. I've, we've got it all, and we have no machine that can do any of those anymore. Um, the, the generations of digital cameras where we took pictures and then saved it to a CD, and now the CD won't work in the computer that, uh, that, we, that we, anybody know what I'm talking about? This, so I, we're looking for pictures, and <laughs> I just didn't want to spend all the time. But except I was there last winter snowmobiling in Yellowstone. If you, if you haven't had that opportunity, I would encourage you to, to do that. So my wife Jeannie grew up in Montana, and her family would go snowmobiling in Yellowstone multiple times through the year. And well, when we lived there, we lived just a couple of hours from her parents. They would come down, we would go to Yellowstone Snowmobile. Now you can't take your own machines in the park, you have to rent their machines, and they only go 40 miles an hour. But the amazing thing is, is that you, you go with a guide. And the first time I'd ever gone through the park last January and heard the story of Yellowstone in the winter, and actually, I've been going there for years and years and years, countless times, and I did, there was things I learned that I'd never known before when you have a guide. So I'd encourage you, it's a, it's a great trip. But here is a, a, a picture, pictures of Yellowstone. If you've been to Old Faithful, you would recognize the Old Faithful Inn. Uh, the, actually, the inside of that building is incredibly phenomenal. You can look it up and, and see that on the internet. But the next picture is Old Faithful, probably the most famous of all the places to uh, see in Yellowstone. If you've been to Yellowstone and you didn't go to Old Faithful, something's wrong. That's just the place, I mean, when you go to Yellowstone, that's just what you do, you go to Old Faithful. So um, if you, if, for those that haven't been, it's not the biggest, it's not the most impressive, it's not the, the tallest uh, of the geysers, the hundreds of geysers, but the, the feature that makes it the most unique is it's faithful. They can predict when it's gonna go off. With, with some pretty accurate precision, they can tell you when it's going off. So when we showed up at this point, you can see the little plume of smoke right, right in the middle. That's the hole where, the, where Old Faithful Geyser is. And so um, there is a boardwalk that goes around one side of, of the, the geyser, and old, the Old Faithful Inn is here. There's a boardwalk with benches. They've put benches in there. That's really a nice feature. But about an hour and a half apart is where, uh, anywhere from an hour to two hours, but averaging about an hour and 40 minutes is the difference. It used to, 35 years ago when I first started going there, it was much, much closer. So it's spread out a little bit, but it's still predictable. And that's, that's what makes Old Faithful, Old Faithful. So 
you'll, you'll get there and there'll be times posted for when the next eruption is charted to take place and they'll, they'll predict it within about 10 minutes. And um, so this is what it looks like when we showed up and you just have to wait, you know, it might be, it might have just gone off five minutes before you got there and you'll have about an hour and a half wait. So you'll spend time, they've got gift shops and all kinds of things like that. But it's cold, this day when we were there, I think it was about 15 degrees. I've been in Yellowstone when it's 40 below zero, snowmobiling, that's a unique experience. Um, so as, as the time gets closer, people start filling in, benches start filling up, the standing room around the area starts, and, and then you'll start seeing a little more uh, plumes of smoke, and you'll start to hear some, some rumbling under the ground, and pretty soon it'll s spray up just a little bit of water, wait several seconds, you'll get another uh, spray of water. Then next thing you know, it looks like this right here. That's pretty phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's a phenomenal feature. And the next, is, next one I have is a, actually a video of it, of it taken off. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And so while that's happening, you know, as activity starts to happen, you'll start getting all kinds of chatter from people, oohs and ahs, people saying, oh, look, did you see that? Did you see that? Every time I've been there, I can't tell you how many times I've been there. It's the same thing over and over. But I'm still amazed. Some of you are looking at the video going, wow, that's cool. Why am I looking? It's a video. <laughs> it's a real thing. But it's amazing as people talk about it, you know, just to, just to hear all the, all the feedback. Did you see that? That was amazing. You know, and, and then it, it starts dying down and it stops and everybody just will, will just disappear and go about uh, looking at the rest of the park. You might hear a child say, Mom, Dad, can we see that again? No, we're not waiting another hour and a half to see. We'll come back in a few years and we'll see it all over again. I'm telling you that I have been there so many times and I promise you that I'll go back to Yellowstone someday and I will go to Old Faithful and I will watch it again like it's the first time I've ever seen it. There's just something awe-striking about seeing a feature like this that you just don't find anywhere else. It's amazing. This morning I wanna propose to you that the same kind of dynamic amazement that happens when you're at Yellowstone watching Old Faithful goes off should be some dynamic, should be the dynamic that we experience when we come to church to worship our God. Every time we come together, we wanna see God move. We wanna, we wanna gather in his presence and when we gather in his presence, we ought to experience the power and the presence of God himself, something that is way beyond ourself, just like Old Faithful. Man, we can't create something like that. It's just natural, but it's supernatural. And the reality is we, when we come together, that's the kind of thing that we want to see happen. We should be in awe. There should be uh, a captivation of who God is and what he can do, the life-changing power of God. I'm not, I'm not saying that we're just looking for an experience. But we've come to the house of the Lord today to worship and to celebrate the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. And many of you in the room have experienced the life-changing power of God in your life. You're a different person than you used to be. And if, you're, if, you're, if you've not experienced that today, you can experience that very reality of what God can do to a life that is offered and submitted and surrendered to him. It's, it's life-changing, hope-filled, life-giving, amazing what God can do in your life. So we come into his presence, and the Bible tells us that in God's presence there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Joy, how many of you have joy today? Okay, listen, we, we've talked about joy. Joy isn't something that is based on our circumstances. Happiness is based on what happens to me, and if everything is falling apart in my life, I'm not gonna to be too happy. But joy is something that we can experience regardless of our circumstances, because joy is based on God, it's based on the presence of God in our life, and we know that he is with us wherever we go. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. We've been talking about this being a culture of joy at New Hope, where we put Jesus first. I promise you that if you, in your life, you put Jesus first in everything, 
And then after that, you, you put others before you put yourself. If J-O-Y, Jesus, others, then you, in that order, you're going to experience real joy. Because there's an order to things and how God designed us. And the book tells us that over and over and over again. To put God first in our life. To make him the primary, the premier, the first over everything. God and no one else above him. That's the, the commandments. That's exactly what he tells us to do. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it all falls into place. So what Old Faithful does for a tourist at Yellowstone, our worship of God should do for our worship, those of us who worship right here at church. Psalm 40, verse 3, he has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. This verse speaks of of two very profound dimensions of worship that I want to unpack real briefly here. One is vertical worship, and two, horizontal. Vertical worship. Our vertical worship is, is celebration. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Very vertical. David had an experience with the Lord. God had rescued him. He had refreshed and restored him through his life. David had experienced the very presence of God, and he was changed. He couldn't be silent. He's put a new song in my mouth, David said. Throughout the Psalms, we see David in exuberant worship. He wasn't silent. He couldn't contain his joy. David had to shout. David had to sing. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And the Psalms are, were meant to be sung. It's a, it's a hymnal. They're, they're words that were meant to be sung be sung and singing is a powerful thing music is a powerful thing music is a powerful tool for good and for and for evil singing is a powerful and an important spiritual expression of ours and we have the opportunity to do that not just here in this room although we do that but that's something that we can experience throughout our day you see david wasn't just singing any song the bible says he was singing a new song a new song from his heart, something that erupted from inside of him and went straight to, straight to praising God. There was a freshness and a newness in David's experience with, with God as if he were seeing God again for the first time. I'm, I'm telling you, it's the same when you go to see Old Faithful. It's like, I've been here before, I've seen this again, but I promise you, I'll go for the umpteenth time and it'll be amazing to me all over again like it's something brand new. And that is the experience that we can have with God. To see God do things that, how many of you have seen God do something in your life recently where you're going, you know what, I'm completely amazed. I shouldn't be, but I'm completely amazed. Because I know with God, all things are possible. I know that God could do this, but you find yourself amazed. Have you had something happen in your life where you go, amazing. It's just amazing what God, what God can do. David's worship was vertical, expressing his gratitude to God for who he is, for what he said and what he has done and what he's going to do. David said this in Psalm 145, three, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. David knew that the source of all that he was and everything that he had done in his life was none other than God himself. He was the source of everything for David. So there's this vertical uh, worship celebration And there's a horizontal, which is a proclamation. There's a vertical dimension to worship, and we see um, that that, that's that's this that there's a horizontal dimension as well. He's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. And then it says, "Many will see what He has done and be amazed." We're talking about what God is doing this way. They will put their trust in God. The way that David worshipped, people didn't just hear him praise. The way David worshipped, they saw him praising. David's joy before the Lord was a witness to the people around him. And like I said earlier, we don't just worship at church because worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a way of life. It's how we live. It's our attitude. It's our actions. It's the the activities that that we participate in. And the scriptures most definitely encourage this horizontal dimension of worship. Let me just share a few scriptures with you. Matthew 5, 16, this is Jesus saying that you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that can't be hidden. 
And then he goes on to say, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He's saying, look, what you do, it should be seen by everyone. You're a city on a hill. No one lights a lamp and, then, and puts it on a lampstand only to put a bucket on it for nobody to see it. He said, I've made you a light. I've set you on a lampstand. You're like a city on a hill. Here's what you do. Shine. And the idea is that other people will see for all of you. Not so that you can look at me, but so that you can look at me and say, man, praise God. That's what God has done in his life. That's the point of it. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God lives in you? We gather to worship together, not just as individuals, but we come together as the body of Christ corporately. David said in Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Listen to what he says. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. There is a horizontal uh, aspect of worship. He says this in Psalm 95 verse 1. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. This is all about us doing this together in a corporate way. We come together for that purpose. The writer of Hebrews said this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And how many of you sense that the day of the Lord's return is getting nearer? We cannot afford to miss out on times like this for us to come together and worship together and experience the presence of God together to encourage one another and and motivate each other to stay the course. Let's keep on in this thing. Let's keep our focus where it needs to be. Let's keep our focus on Jesus. Let's keep our focus on, on heaven, the things above, not on the things of this earth. We cannot focus on CNN, Fox News, They're giving us some information, but listen, that's not where our source is. We've got to fix our eyes on the one who is the creator, the one who is the sustainer, the one who can change things. And when we as a church gather to worship, there's this horizontal element to our worship that is called witness. Many will see what has been done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. So I believe that when people who are far away from God hear those who are close to him worshiping with all of their heart to the Lord. When they see the enthusiasm, the exuberance, and the the wonder of sincere worship to God, there's an attraction to that. There is a contagious element to someone who is lost, who is dry spiritually, seeing someone else worship with excitement and exuberance and full of joy. It's contagious. It's like seeing Old Faithful. You see what's going on and you go, what is happening here? It's it's kind of mysterious, but you know that it's something that's wonderful and it's totally amazing and I don't have to understand it all. I'm just standing here just awestruck at what's going on. And that's how we worship the Lord. Listen, sparks from a fire catch things that are dry on fire. And so sparks from the fire of our worship can ignite a dry heart. You have no idea who's sitting next to you. Maybe they're dry. And what you do and what you've done in worship and what you uh, can do in just giving your praise to God, listen, you're a fire. Burn. You're a light. Shine. So that everybody else can see. Because somebody else needs encouragement. Someone else needs a spark. Someone else, their flame is smoldering. And you can come along and just by you being you and your worship to God because you've put him first, you've put him foremost, and that's all you're gonna, that's what I do. I just worship because I'm a follower of Jesus. I worship him. I'm not making excuses. I'm not saying, hey, look at me. I'm just gonna worship him. And if sparks from me, Jump off and hit that dry person over here and he catches flame. Yes! Isn't that awesome? Why do you think that revivals of days past 
would just draw such a crowd because God was moving and God was doing, there was excitement in the worship, there was preaching that was powerful, and lives were being touched and changed. And people would come from miles away from the other side of the world just to come and see what God is doing. Reminds me of Acts chapter two when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. It says that there was the sound of a mighty, mighty rushing wind, that there were flames of fire that sat on their heads, and those that were gathered there had each one of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak other languages as, as the Spirit gave them that ability to do so. And in verse six it says, when, when they heard the loud noise, meaning the people that were around the upper room where the disciples had gathered, that everyone came running and they were bewildered. They were completely amazed. And they were asking this question, how can this be? And they were taking notice, noticing that these people that were speaking uh, and, and all that was going on, they were saying, these are Galilean people. These are sticks from the hicks, guys. These are uneducated people. How is it that we hear these uneducated people speaking in our own, our own languages? It's like at first it was gibberish and all of a sudden they realized, he's speaking my language. How did he hear? That guy's speaking your language. How and they're just bewildered. There's something crazy about this. But what they were saying wasn't gibberish. It was speaking in their language, talking about the amazing things that God had done. Powerful, powerful experience. They were amazed and perplexed and they asked this question, what can this mean? And you know, in that, in that experience, Peter gets up and, and preaches a message. It's absolutely phenomenal. But God will use our worship to be a witness to the people around us. There's uh, two dimensions to worship. There's two outcomes. Back to Psalm 40, verse 3. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what, has, what he has done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. Are you all with me? Let's, let's say this verse together. It's on the screen. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. And throughout the Bible, there's this, relational, uh, this relationship between worship and witness, and it's reflected in two outcomes. One is this. People who are far from God are drawn to Christ through worship. And people who are close to God are compelled to share Christ through worship. And so it could be diagrammed like this right here. There's the word worship with an arrow on the left and an arrow on the right. People who are far from God can be drawn to Christ through worship. That's the left arrow. Authentic worship attracts. It's contagious. Like a magnet, it draws people to Jesus. Jesus said this in John 12, 32, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. And I know in that he was predicting his death, and, uh, but, but at the same time, um, it communicates volumes to us about worship. Saying when, when Jesus is lifted up in worship, lost people are attracted to him. David said in Psalm 57, nine, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. It's something public, a worship that goes public. There's an evangelistic attraction to honest, sincere, authentic worship. When God's people experience his presence, when they meet God face to face and their hearts are engaged and activated in worship, lives are changed. And lost people are drawn to God's presence as well. See, when things like that happen, the world sets up and takes notice. I've heard this saying, and I, I can't, Pinpoint who said it, if anybody ever said it, but maybe you've heard this statement before. It goes like this. If a church was on fire for God, then people would come for miles to watch it burn. If a church was on fire for God, then people would come for miles to watch it burn. Maybe that's true. We like to follow fire trucks. If you ever grew up in a small town community, that's, that was a pastime. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? Follow the fire truck, go see what's burning. I've heard, I've personally heard people from this church make this statement that's similar to that. A church that is alive is worth the drive. And I will tell you this, that there are 
many people who drive and are part of this church who drive at least 55 miles one way to come to church. We have a family that drives from Adair. That's 55 miles. It takes 51 minutes. We have a family that came from Fontenelle, 64 miles. It's an hour and six minutes. They've since moved to Grimes to be near their family and to be near church. We've got people in the service from New Sharon, 71 miles away. They're here faithfully, hour and six minutes. At least that's what Google tells me. We have people in the service today that come to this church from Lamoni, Iowa, 80 miles away, an hour and 12 minutes. We have people that come from Lineville, 85 miles away. We have a family that comes from Lenox, 91 miles, an hour and 35 minutes, one way to church. They'll be here in the 11 o'clock service. That means they had to leave home before we started this service. And they, they started coming since we were not meeting with COVID and through another family in our church got connected and we made contact through um, the connect card. And, and so I was talking to her on the phone and I said, you know, there's a lot of great churches between here and you. We can get you connected so it's not so far to drive. And she said, I don't want one of those churches. I want this church. And they've been coming ever since. It's amazing. That, let alone we have people that drive from Soli, 47 miles, Ogden, 40 miles, many people from Winterset, from Perry, many from Indianola are in this service, and Carlisle. I mean, people drive. A church that is alive is worth the drive. I promise you that if people were not experiencing the presence of God, they would not drive that far to come to a church that is dead and dull. And it's not about me, it's not about any of the other pastors, it's about God. It's his church, it's his people being God's people and worshiping him. Listen, if a church was on fire for God, then people would drive miles just to watch it burn. Listen, if you're on fire, people might stand around and watch you burn. But here's the cool thing, sparks flying off you catch somebody else on fire. You got dry people who are lost, who don't know Jesus, it's contagious. We put like things on our, on our, what do you call them? The little thing in the back where you got a fire pit. Sorry, it's not my notes. <laughs> you got a little screen to put on because sometimes a fire gets big and sparks are going this way. You don't want to set that neighbor's house on fire, but that's what fire does. Listen, unbelievers may not understand everything that happens in a church service, but they know joy when they see it. That's why developing a culture of joy is so important. So when they walk in, they go, I don't know what's going on here, but this is exciting. I, I have people all the time walk in and go, oh, this, this church is way bigger than any other church that I've been to, but it's amazing because everybody knows everybody, and everybody likes being here, and everybody talks to everybody else. And the reality is, is you, know, you all don't know everybody. None of, us, none of us can, really. My goal is to do that. And some of you, if I don't know you, please meet me at the door. I want to I wanna say hi to you and meet you. But that's our, that's our goal in our tent. It's not, it's not for everybody to know everybody, but to be known and to know people. There's a genuine enthusiasm, a genuine love for God and for people that is contagious. They know joy, they know authenticity, and they know when lives are impacted and when their life is changed. And wouldn't the opposite be true too? What happens when a spiritually distant person sees boredom on the faces of the worshipers in the church service? What do they think when they come into worship and people just have their arms folded, scowl on their face? You think they'd come back and drive an hour and a half to come to a church like that? As long as I'm getting personal with this, let me take this a step further. Parents, what are your children learning about your demeanor in worship? Do they see you as, uh, as excited to come to church as you are to go to a sporting event? Do they see you with the same enthusiasm getting ready to come to church as you are getting ready to go on a vacation? Do they see you as hungry to be in church and to worship as you are for other things in life. Listen to what I'm saying, children are watching. They are watching. Not only are people drawn to Christ through worship, but people who are close to God are compelled to share Christ through worship. 
Through worship, lost people are drawn to Christ, and, and the second outcome is that believers are compelled to share Christ with others. In this diagram, this is, it's the right arrow. We'll look at a few scriptures. There's a correlation between people encountering God through worship and going out to share Christ with others. Isaiah chapter 6. I've got to fly through this really quick. Isaiah chapter 6, a passage that you're familiar with. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. He said, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Send me. Isaiah was appointed to go and speak to his people, but only after he saw the Lord in worship. He saw, he heard, and he responded. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 28, his last words before he ascended into heaven. Listen to what it says, Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the great commission, the church's heartbeat for existence, to go and tell others about Jesus, making disciples of all nations. Listen to the context. I don't know if you noticed this before, but the command was given at a worship encounter. Jesus showed up and it said that they worshiped him and then he gave them this commission to go. But the point is that it's in the context of worship. Back in Acts chapter two, we alluded to that just a few minutes ago. The sound of worship that filled the upper room, it was heard by God-fearing Jews from every nation. Many of those people who thought, these people, these people are drunk. That's what they, that's what they thought was going on. But then they realize they're speaking the many wonderful things that God has done. And the result of that great worship event on the day of Pentecost was only about 3,000 people being baptized and added to the church that day. Peter just stood up in that moment and began to preach. And it said that he preached for a long time. And, and, and at some point in the sermon, he didn't even know like, what an altar call was, what do I do? I, he did, wasn't even thinking that way. People had to interrupt him and say, Okay, we, we, we heard, tell us what we should do. And he said, repent and be baptized. And then he goes on preaching some more. But 3,000 people came to Christ that day. Listen, if we truly meet God and we have an encounter with him, then there's gonna be worship. It's gonna be the result. And if you truly worship, other people are gonna be drawn to him. And as you are drawn to God, you are gonna be compelled to go and witness. And you say, what? Time out, don't wanna do that. Why? Why would we not share what Jesus has done in our life? Maybe he hasn't done anything. You need, you need the presence of God in your life to do something. He's here to meet you today. But if he's done something for you, man, stand up on the hill and shout it to the skies, to anyone who will listen. That's what happens. You find a good deal somewhere, you're going to tell people about it. And that's what Jesus does. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come. So what do we do? Like the people on the day of Pentecost asking Peter, okay, what do we do? Listen, number one, we come to celebrate. When we gather here today, we come to celebrate. Life gets in the way of our relationship with God oftentimes when we don't make him and our worship of him a priority. This has gotta be a priority in our life. Listen, he's given you grace and mercy and forgiveness and his power to pull you up from the pit of life to give you a firm footing, a sure foundation. And, and this is what we do. We give him our troubles. We give him our worries. We give him our problems, our anxieties, our fears, and experience the presence of God and his power to change our lives. That's what he does. And then tell other people. Tell other people about your experience. Listen, we can't just use this experience for ourselves and hold it to ourselves. How long has it been since you invited someone to join you? How long has it been since you had a conversation where you've told somebody about how they can know Jesus? Man, I, I've got a church, you come, just come, just join me. He's the answer to life's challenges. He's the answer to life's experience. 
bring people along with you to experience the same things that you've experienced. I want to ask you where you're at on this diagram. Are you on the left side of worship? Are you being drawn to Christ? I say, great, be a worshiper. Worship with all your heart. Listen, God doesn't need your worship, but he cherishes your worship. You were created for that purpose, to worship him. And if you're on the left side of the word worship and you've never invited Jesus to be Lord of your life, I encourage you and implore you today, make that decision. I want to ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes. If you don't know Jesus, you've not invited him into your life to forgive you of your sins and be Lord and Savior of your life, I encourage you to step out in faith today and accept what he's done for you. Invite him into your life. He will change you. He will do amazing things you can't even begin to explain. There's a hope and a peace and a joy and a love that you've never experienced before. If that's you today, you're sitting here in the room or you're online, and you would respond saying, Pastor Jeff, that's me. I know I need Jesus. And today I'm responding, saying yes to Jesus and inviting him to be Lord of my life. If that's you today and you just raise your hand, just raise your hand and keep it raised. I want to pray with you. Across the room, anyone. Thank you, sir. In the back. Anyone else? those that raise their hand, would you, would you just pray with me? All of us just pray together. Lord, I just thank you for this moment. God, with these I pray, Lord, we invite you into our life. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Change my heart. Make me new. Bring this hope and this joy and this peace that we're talking about. Lord, I need that excitement and enthusiasm. Life has just become a drudgery. And I need to experience your love, and your presence in a real way. I invite you in. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Change my life. Set me on a new course that leads to you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So thankful for what God is doing, speaking into hearts and lives so thankful for a response and I don't know what, what do you do today how are you going to respond this is how we're going to respond is we're going to worship and I want to challenge you listen this might not be natural for you I promise you I'm going to stand on the front row and I'm going to sing from the bottom of my guts as loud as I can it won't sound pretty but it's going to be the God and I think that we need to step out of our comfort zone and just say, you know what, God's worth, it was worth him to die in my place, it's worth it for me to give him praise. So we're going to close with just this, we're, we're just going to spend a few more minutes, but I want to encourage you, stand with me, I encourage you to lift your hands, lift your voice, let's lift our praise, let's worship him with all that we have in us.